Welcome to Alaska Weather, a production of Alaska Public Media and the National Weather Service, Alaska Region. Produced and broadcast daily from the studios of KAKM, Alaska Weather provides complete forecasts, public, marine, and aviation for all of Alaska. Alaska Weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service. And good Friday, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with you on this 1st of April. As always, we encourage you to stay up to date with your local you to head to www.weather.gov slash Alaska for your latest weather information on this April 1st. As always, the weather info line is open at 800-472-0391 and during the day you can get information that way or on social media as you choose at NWS Alaska where you'll find a listing of South Central and Southwestern's record high temperatures for the day. Uh, many places have been seeing uh, above normal temperatures for at least a couple days now and we've been reaching record levels again yesterday and again today with a record high of 51 here in Anchorage this afternoon among others. Around uh, Twitter, you can find uh, local information from Fairbanks at NWS Fairbanks and Anchorage at NWS Anchorage and for South Central and Southwestern Alaska. And for the panhandle, NWS Juno is a place to go using the hashtag AKWX. will bring you into the uh, weather conversation for the entire state, no matter where you are. And on YouTube, of course, your daily afternoon map briefing found online there around 4 o'clock. Simply look for AKWX TV. And uh, off we go here, and it looks like that we'll continue to see uh, wind and snow for many of the north and western coastal regions as we get into the uh, overnight hours again and into uh, the weekend. Many areas along the northern uh, slopes of the Brooks Range now in on the winter weather advisory there for at least some minor accumulations as much as four to seven inches in some cases there. But the wind's really going to be the big story here for the central Beaufort Sea coast as well as the Chukchi Sea coast and into the Kotzebue Sound region expecting about four to seven inches across the Yukon Valley as well. And now blizzard warnings posted for the western tip of the Seward Peninsula, St. Lawrence Island as well as the Yukon Delta. That will continue through tonight and in some cases into early tomorrow morning. Also watching for strong wind gusts reaching 55 to 60 miles per hour through some of the gaps and the higher terrain there uh, across some of the highways as well for the uh, Alaska Range, especially on the north slopes and into the Deltana and Tanana Flats region. So a lot of active weather for the interior, for the north slope, for the west coast, for Norton Sound, and for the Seward Peninsula. That does include Nome as well. So plan accordingly and be careful out there. More snow and more wind on the way. In the meantime, we're watching for breakup uh, for southern sections of Alaska and southwest. Temperatures have been fairly mild, uh, especially from Bethel southward and for south central Alaska. Now, as conditions continue to get warmer into uh, April there, we'll see uh, some changes on the riverways. But for right now, uh, the breakup map for March 30th, the most recent update here from the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center. You can find that at aprfc.arh.noaa.gov is showing mostly ice in just about all of our main rivers across the 49th state. Here's a look at the big weather picture and as you can see across all of the state uh, the big swirl of moisture across the region is what's feeding in uh, the very un uh, unusual warmth for southern Alaska until earlier today is pretty much a, a cloud free day for many in southeast. The moisture is starting to creep your way once again so another round of rain in the offing for southeastern Alaska, what would you do without it? And across the west coast, the northerly flow coming down Kotzebue Sound and across the west, feeding in colder air and meeting up with moisture and that storm energy wrapping into southwestern and uh, the lower parts of the uh, Yukon Valley of Alaska. So all this coming together to produce a pretty decent snowmaker across the Yukon Valley and certainly pushing that warm air further and further northward. So it will be interesting to see how much of that cold gets kind of pushed out of the way here as we get into early next week as the warmer air continues to work northward across uh, into the Brooks Range and maybe eventually to the North Slope. In the meantime, it's not warm enough to not make it snow. It is snowing across most of the Yukon Valley there and with the wind really uh, biting down on the Yukon Delta region there. Uh, places like Newtok picked up several inches of snow and we got a report, a report from some of our friends out there earlier today that uh, it was raining now on top of the wind-driven snow that you had, kind of making a, a crust on top of that. Maybe about six inches of snow had fallen there. So if that's how it is in your village, let us know. You can do that on Facebook fairly easily. 
Uh, or if you'd like to send a tweet, just use a, uh, AKWX as your hashtag and we'll see that. But we'd love to know how you're doing out there across the uh, YK Delta and into the Norton Sound region there. Your storm reports certainly help us do our job better and report conditions to more places that can use your information anytime. So the satellite picture is showing us that trend. And again, that warmer air lifting northward will continue to bring a chance for rain across south central and across the Alaska Peninsula. Windy conditions here. Wind and snow for parts of the YK Delta into Norton Sound in the Yukon Valley with winter weather advisories there for at least four to six inches of snow and gusts upwards of 35 to maybe even 40 miles per hour in some cases, which could bring up blizzards uh, in your area or conditions that are very close to that. The effect is the same. If you can't see and it's dangerous to travel, again, it's just a good time to stay put and let it uh, kind of settle down as we get into the weekend. Here's a look at the weather map now. Low pressure sitting around Eagle was uh, just to the south side of that. Northway, though, saw temperatures back in the 50s today, so a very mild day across the Alcan border for some places. On the north side of this, though, still cooler around the Yukon Valley, areas of uh, wind and snow for the Brooks Range, Ambler and Bettles, all the way out toward the Chukchi Sea Coast. Snow and blowing snow for parts of uh, Tin City and Wales, all the way out toward Nome. Low pressure across areas just outside of Bristol Bay at 986 millibars, bringing in the warm and wet air for the Alaska Peninsula and parts of the interior southwest. Rain was falling around Prince William Sound, the Kenai Peninsula, as well as Kodiak Island and southeast, mainly looking at clouds advancing into the region there. Some spots of uh, light rain perhaps around Petersburg and uh, Klawak late this afternoon. And you can see again the cold air flowing out of the bearing and off the ice, which is what we're looking at right here, kind of this uh, rough surface on the white. That is actually a visible satellite picture of the ice across the bearing. The cold air flowing off of that is making some beautiful cloud streets across the southern and western Bering Sea. As we head into tonight, a 994 millibar low will be sitting off the YK Delta. Again, that's going to keep the potential for blizzard conditions across the Yukon Delta. Again, north of Bethel from Ammonic all the way into the Norton Sound region. Winter weather advisories will continue, as you can see, for snow and blowing snow for many areas along the Yukon Valley. Again, up to about four to six, maybe seven inches of snow there. And that's pushing across the Brooks Range summit. So plan on different conditions for the north slope of the Brooks Range as we get into tonight and into tomorrow. Rain's a possibility for southeast. Saturday looks for showers across most of the region. The higher terrain, of course, will have an opportunity for some snow. Mainly rain showers across south central. Most of that looks like it's going to avoid a uh, large part of the Cook Inlet there. We might see some showers passing through quickly, but most of it will be on the Prince William Sound side as well as some of the higher terrain and into southwest. There's an opportunity for rain and snow to mix across the Yukon Delta and into Norton Sound as we head into Saturday there so that uh, really high risk of snow will start to mix in with some slightly warmer air but behind that is still snow showers across the central chain and snow and blowing snow for many areas north of the Yukon Valley as we head into Saturday afternoon. For Sunday, low pressure is moving up across the Seward Peninsula. That's going to allow warmer air to gradually lift northward up the lower and middle Yukon Valley. Snow is still a threat for the Brooks Range southern facing slopes. The north side still looking at blowing snow and much colder weather across the Chukchi Sea Coast. Snow and blowing snow still a factor there for the central chain. Watch for periods of light snow and some fog with low pressure moving up the eastern chain toward the Alaska Peninsula at 981 millibars. We'll keep that warm flow working into southwestern Alaska, so rain and milder temperatures there. For south central, showers mainly across the Cook Inlet region from time to time and periods of light rain for Prince William Sound. Another wave of low pressures working off uh, the shore for southeastern Alaska, and that's going to keep that southeasterly flow working your way. Gradually milder weather there, but also more clouds and, of course, more steady rainfall opportunities there heading into the weekend. Let's talk temperatures today. Across southeast, we saw many areas back in the lower to mid 50s. The cooler spots, if you want to call it that, still in the upper 40s, but the capital city all the way down to Ketchikan, Annette, Craig, and Klawak, Hyder, all saw temps easily in the 50s there. Around Haida Gwaii, temps were just shy of 50 at 3 o'clock. Many places continued to warm into 4. Around uh, the lower to mid 40s for Prince William Sound today, Anchorage hit a record high of 51 this afternoon. So it was 49 at 3 o'clock, and we made it up to 51 here. 52 around uh, Squitna and uh, 33 around Fairbanks, fairly mild there as well. Eagle was 29, but on the south side of that frontal boundary, remember I said Northway saw 56. There you go. Pretty mild stuff there. Looking northward, 9 degrees in Fort Yukon, 9 above in Arctic Village, 9 below for Anaktuvik Pass, and there's that cold around the north slope. Just can't get rid of that with high pressure sitting off the shore. 
anywhere from 15 to 20 below in the afternoon. So certainly colder at night, around 20 to 30 below in many cases. Teens and 20s for Kotzebue Sound. It was 28 in Nome today, 25 for Galena, 36 in McGrath. Uh, Monarch was showing 27 with Nunavak Island at 32. And for Southwest, Dillingham and King Salmon saw temps in the 40s today. And most areas in the Alaska Peninsula were easily that warm. Lower 30s for St. Paul and St. George, 43 in Unalaska and Dutch Harbor, and lower to mid 30s for most of the central and western chain, with the exception of Atka, just shy of 40 degrees. Now, overnight lows will likely stay in the lower to mid 30s for the chain, 29 for St. Paul, south central, above freezing again tonight, 37 in Kodiak, and lower 40s for southeast. The middle Tanana Valley and Fairbanks closer to 22, and then once you get north of the Yukon, temperatures cool off significantly into the single digits to about 10 degrees or so. Minus one for Arctic Village, anywhere from minus 20 to minus 30 degrees for most of the north slope, including Kaktovik, all the way out toward uh, Wales and uh, places like uh, Wainwright and uh, Atkasuk, all looking at some big cold tonight. 21 around Nome, and look for southwestern temperatures in the lower to mid 30s. Highs tomorrow across southwest, south central, and southeast will all be uh, pretty close to uh, at or above normal levels there. South central certainly above normal by a long shot, uh, closer to 50 degrees in many locations, 46 in southeast, and uh, lower 50s for many in southeast as well. Southwest will look for temperatures in the mid to upper 40s to about 50 degrees around King Salmon and Dillingham. Lower to mid 30s for the central and western chain, Nome about 29 degrees. Uh, north of the uh, Brooks Range summits, north slope, you're looking at 5 to about 15 below for daytime high temperatures. Kivalina and Kotzebue looking at teens and 20s tomorrow. On to flying weather now, the red is IFR, and you can see that snaking across the Brooks Range summits through Kotzebue Sound, St. Lawrence Island, and wrapping into low pressure across southwestern Alaska with low pressure right about here. That's going to put a lot of the worst weather along the west coast, but it is going to be fairly windy here. So remember, this just takes into account the visibility factor, the distance, and the ceiling of the clouds. Southeast, you're looking at MVFR conditions as uh, developing tomorrow morning, and that wraps all the way back into Prince William Sound with IFR across places like Valdez and the northern sections of the Susitna Valley. As we get into the afternoon, conditions improve in southeast and around south central in the Susitna Valley, but you'll notice with low pressure still sitting across southwestern Alaska, that really keeps the focus for some poor visibility and low ceilings across uh, the middle Yukon Valley as well as the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range and that sneaks over those summits as we get into the afternoon. Here's your pass conditions in Anaktuvik and Anagan Pass not looking good tomorrow thanks to snow and poor visibility expected throughout most of the day. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass should see improvements throughout the day heading for MVFR conditions as we get into the afternoon on Saturday. Rainy Pass looking for MVFR to develop throughout the day. Windy Pass holding at MVFR. Same goes for Isabel Pass for your Saturday afternoon. Mentasta Pass likely starting at VFR with lowered ceilings developing throughout the day. Tanita Pass, we expect MVFR conditions to hold through most of your Saturday and to develop in Portage Pass, so some improvement may be noted there. And Chilkoot and White Pass also looking for improvements as we head into the afternoon. Freezing levels show that warm and wet air should retreat a little bit more tomorrow and back its way into uh, places like Alberta and uh, the southern portions of the Yukon Territory in British Columbia. With the surface freezing line, though, still holding very close to places like Bethel, and around Cordova, it looks like that warm and wet air, again, doesn't have as much support for freezing rain as ice as it did uh, just a couple days ago. So maybe some improvements in that regard. Icing potential, though, if you're flying, is still present across the North Slope and across the Yukon Valley. A lot of that's going to be holding at or above 4,000 feet for significant icing, occasional moderate perhaps. St. Lawrence Island to uh, the Bering Strait, expected to see some icing threats there, as well as the central chain in areas around the Alaska Peninsula wrapping into that next storm above 6,000 feet out, out over the open water. Now, as far as the jet stream goes, we've got a significant wind coming in from the west across the north slope from 70 to as much as 150 knots as it get in, gets into the heart of Canada. Uh, the main player, though, is the super highway of weather that is still south of Alaska. And that's running anywhere from 55 knots coming in from the south and west across the extreme southern parts of southeastern Alaska to the North Pacific, and, and that's running around 100 to 150 knots. The point to be made here is that it's still south of the state, and this is where the action or the storm track is found. You'll notice that's not really pointing at Alaska right now. However, low pressure waves are working their way up and leaving that flow and finding their way into Alaska with this type of weather pattern now. And you can see that here with southerly flow at 9,000 feet. Winds are around 20 to 30 knots 
coming in from the south and southwest and then bending off into Alaska rounding a ridge of high pressure coming up the west coast and the Pacific Northwest. It's keeping things fairly warm across south central and southeast right now. Here's the cold air that's coming in across the western bearing around 20 to 30 knots and we have several interruptions in that flow. Each one of those low pressure systems there kind of caught up in this uh, action right now. At 9,000 feet low pressure sitting very close to St. Lawrence Island and near Ammonic that is helping to speed up winds from the south across southwestern Alaska, keeping the moisture and the lift focused there for you and keeping the wind and the snow production going for the Yukon Delta as well as most of the Yukon Valley and the south facing slopes of the Brooks Range. Here's our ridge of high pressure right now across the west coast. You'll see that bringing in southerlies across the north Gulf Coast and uh, wrapping those lighter winds into western parts of Canada as we look at 3,000 feet. Wind speeds across the north slope right now running around 15 to 25, southwest 25 to 30, and for southeast fairly light, only 10 to 15 knots there for tomorrow. As far as turbulence goes, expect at least some isolated moderate across the northwest coast. A better chance for occasional moderate around the uh, Bering Strait, around 5,000 feet and below, and across the Alaska Range, especially north, uh, with wind advisories again posted for some of the surface levels, and across the Kuskokoon Valley into the lower Yukon Valley, generally below 5,000 feet there. That's a look at your aviation forecast. I'll be back with a look at the sea ice edge for the weekend, as well as your marine weather. Stay tuned. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mary O'Connor with the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation, and in my day job, I manage the Aviation Safety Program at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health here in Anchorage. Thanks to Alaska Public Media for allowing us to bring you hangar flying. This evening, we are pleased to have back on our show, Jared Hoagland. He's the new Executive Director of the Alaska Aviation Museum. Welcome to the show, Jared. Thanks, it's great to be back. Jared, you took over as executive director in December, which is just a couple months ago. Right. Um, but I understand you're not exactly new to the museum. No, I've, I've been with the museum for about two years. I've actually, for the last two years, I've actually been working as collections manager, so been in the stuff. Okay, and collections manager, you mean? I'm the one who takes care of the artifacts, the photographs, and the archives, and uses them to create exhibits. I, yeah. You're not I'm not collecting the loans. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and are you new to aviation? Um, I was new, I'm first introduced to aviation when I started at the museum. I have a little bit of background in history as well as museum work. I have degrees in history and economics, but new to aviation. And really, when I first started, I found it fascinating, and I still do. The history of aviation in Alaska is wide, it's great, and it's so important to us as Alaskans that we really need to share more of it. And you are not new to Alaska, no. so I think everybody that lives here for any length of time has uh, some amount of aviation experience. Exactly. Born and raised third generation. Wow. So what kind of changes do you foresee implementing at the museum? Well, a lot of what we're focusing now is creating exhibits which are more interactive. We're trying to bring in a new audience, a younger audience, into the museum. And really, thanks to a grant from Rasmussen Foundation, we're able to put in about 50 new exhibits this spring. Wow. Yeah, so to, for the first time in the museum's history, we're going to have individual personal signs for every aircraft and every major artifact throughout the museum. Are the exhibits and the interactive activities going to be geared towards children or adults or both? They're actually geared towards both. And so we're not foregoing physical science. We're still going to have physical signage, but it now will connect artifacts to people through their histories. And we'll also have digital iPads that allow people to dig in further if they'd like. Oh, wow. It's really, I mean, the museum has about, been about the machine before, and mm -hmm. it still will be about the machine. But we want to introduce the people behind it and the stories that really made it aviation in Alaska alive. So talking about the machines, are you going to continue with the aircraft restorations? Absolutely. We're actually still in the middle of a restoration that's also sponsored by the Rasmussen Foundation, which is a 1942 Stinson L1. It's nearly finished and it was a light observation airplane that was used um, in the Aleutians. Is the intent for this aircraft to fly? Absolutely. So it'll be in the air this summer and really this is part of our outreach to give people a better step into history because we're going to be able to give people rides in this aircraft. And so once you're flying in the same aircraft that used to do naval reconnaissance missions looking for Japanese naval vessels, it really brings a whole new perspective to the history. Oh sure, that's kind of a, a living, breathing experience. Exactly. Of... We, we want to be a living museum. Great. 
is the focus going to be more towards um, visitors to Anchorage in Alaska, or is it still going to be appealing to people that live here? Actually, at currently, um, most of our visitors are from outside of Alaska. Mm -hmm. There's still that intrigue about Alaska and its history and its ruggedness. We're, so we're actually gearing a lot more of our focus to Alaskans themselves. Because Alaskan aviation history is so central to who we are as Alaskans, we want every Alaskan to come in and see that history. Wow. Um, so as for people that live here, even in Anchorage, um, is the museum still going to be available for rental? I think oh, a lot of folks might not know about oh, that absolutely. opportunity. We're actually expanding our facility rental process. Um, and so really the museum has a lot of spaces that are ideal for facility rentals and there's no better place to have your event than in the middle of all this history. It's a really truly unique place, especially right there on Lake Hood. And while people are at the museum for um, say a, a wedding celebration or some other kind of get together, they're still allowed to walk around in that space and look at the exhibits Absolutely. and interact. Absolutely, you get the, the full museum experience as well as your own event. Very cool. Um, what about the simulators? I saw something <laughs> about new simulators. Yes, we have new simulators. Um, so we're using a new simulator that uses the Oculus Rift headset, which is a fully immersed 3D set. So once you actually put you in the cockpit of aircraft, um, whether it's civilian aircraft or military aircraft, it puts you in a pilot seat and it feels like you're there. It's an incredible experience. That sounds like reason enough just to host a party there so that the guests Absolutely. can Absolutely. It's been, it's check been out very the popular. We've actually given over a thousand <laughs> rides since we've instituted it last fall. Wow, that's impressive. Well, thank you, Jared. We've enjoyed having you on the show and hearing all about the exciting things that you have planned for the Alaska Aviation Museum. It's been great. I look forward to being back. Thank you. We wish you a lot of luck and we know that you'll do well showcasing Alaska's rich history. Thank you. This program was sponsored by the Alaskan Aviation Safety Foundation. If you enjoy this program and enjoy hearing about what's going on in the aviation community, please consider becoming a volunteer with the Safety Foundation. You can contact us on our website or on Facebook to learn more about volunteer opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, fly safely. Time for a quick check of your sea ice edge, and it really hasn't changed a whole lot in the last few days there. It is trying to advance southward, and strips of ice are moving away from the main pack. However, as it runs into some very warm air, a lot of that's melting fairly quickly, so again, it's not advancing southward at all. Now you can see some uh, slightly more open water around uh, McCoryuk in south and east into the Kuskokwim Bay, and then that's about where it stops at this point, just south of Nunavak Island and St. Matthew Island for the main ice pack and concentrations there above 80%. You can check this out anytime at weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice dot php. Here's a look at the weather in southeast in the marine areas for Saturday. Southerlies inland canal at 25 knots. Winds a little bit lower than that as you head into the central and southern inner channels at 10 to 15. Seas running about 2 to 3 feet except 5 feet in the Lynn Canal and then more of an onshore flow across the outer coast. Uh, from the west, about 10 to 15, a little bit slower as you head south of Sitka with six foot seas expected into the Dixon entrance. Sunday, northerlies continue uh, for parts of the uh, inner channels there, looking for 15 knots in the Lynn Canal, three foot seas. Southeasterlies inside of Clarence Strait, 20 knots with a four foot sea. And south and easterly winds develop across the outer coast, about 15 to 20, looking at seven foot seas in all areas there on Sunday. For south central, southerlies working into Prince William Sound and across the western gulf at 15 to 20, two foot seas on the inside of Prince William Sound, nine to 10 foot seas across the western gulf and southerlies from Shelikoff Strait all the way up toward Cook Inlet at 20 to 25. Seas holding around seven to as high as nine feet in Cook Inlet and six foot seas are expected inside of Shelikoff Strait for Saturday. For Sunday, look for more of a north and easterly flow coming down Cook Inlet and easterly winds cutting across the Barrens at 10 to 20 with six foot seas there as well as inside of Shelikoff Strait. Northerlies develop inside of Prince William Sound, still holding at 10 knots though, so pretty light and small seas at two feet and more of a variable if not an easterly wind developing across the north and western gulf around 10 to 15 knots with seas around six to seven feet for Sunday. Across the Alaska Peninsula, winds will be up around uh, 25 knots or so from the south Inside of Bristol Bay at six feet uh, with six foot seas expected. East and southeasterly winds coming in 
from Castle Cape to Chignook and all the way down towards Sandpoint and King Cove. 20 to 25 with 9 foot seas on the Pacific Coast for Sunday. Uh, that diminishes from Castle Cape to Chignook down to 8 feet. But look at the change there from Sandpoint to King Cove. A strong and healthy easterly flow comes in at 40 knots and boosts seas to 16 feet there. So watch it there. Southeasterly is inside of Bristol Bay, uh, become northeasterly a little bit further down the Bering Strait coast or Bering Sea coast with four foot seas expected there on Sunday on a 25 knot wind. Across the Aleutian, southeasterlies from Nikolsky to Unalaska at 15 knots with a 6 to 8 foot sea. Northerlies from Atka westward all the way out toward Kiska and Attu with 20 to 25 knots. 10 to 14 foot seas expected on Saturday. That diminishes as we get into Sunday, still on a northerly flow. And northeasterlies from Unalaska toward Nikolsky at 25 knots, 6 to 7 foot seas on the Pacific side and 6 to 8 foot seas on the Bering Sea side. Across the west coast, northerlies coming across the ice and Gamble at 35 knots as well as St. Matthew, but a little bit slower at 20 knots. A variable flow for the Provolovs with a 4-foot sea, and southerlies coming into the Kuskokwim Bay at 25 knots with a 7-foot sea. Those become east and northeasterlies in just about all areas. One exception across St. Lawrence Island, that's a southerly wind at 20 knots, otherwise 20 to 25 in all areas and 5 to 6-foot seas across the open water. And across the north slope, east and northeasterly winds are the fastest across the Chukchi Sea coast, 20 to 40 knots there. West of Cape Lisburn and Point Hope, 25 knots for the Beaufort Sea coast on Saturday. And that diminishes slightly to 20 knots on Sunday. East and northeasterly winds for the Chukchi Sea coast at 20 to 30. And northeasterlies inside of Kotzebue Sound around 20 knots there for Sunday afternoon. Recapping tonight's weather, blizzard warning is still in effect for the Yukon Delta, and it looks like uh, wind and snow will be the rule for the Yukon Valley and northward toward the south-facing slopes of the Brooks Range, but snow and wind will be working northward as we head through tonight, and many areas expect 4 to 7 inches of snow, with the exception of the YK Delta, where you could see about 1 to 2, and a lot of that will be blowing around. Wind advisories for the Alaska Range and into the Deltana and Tananoff Flats region, watching for wind speeds from about 40 to 50 mile an hour and gusty throughout the evening. Rain showers develop across south central and southwest and move back into southeastern Alaska with snow and blowing snow continuing in the north and the interior as we head through the weekend. Have a good one and we'll see you again tomorrow. These forecasts are to be used for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. Alaska weather is made possible by the following sponsors. The National Weather Service.